Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh To carry on with the surgical anatomy lectures I'm gonna discuss in this presentation The anatomy of the anterior abdominal wall I'm Dr. Dalia Saleh Professor and the head of anatomy department At Mansoura University, Egypt In this presentation I will discuss the following points First, the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall Regarding their anatomy and biomechanics the rectus sheath and the linea alba regarding their anatomy and biomechanics and finally the umbilical ring and umbilical fascia and their anatomical variations the anterior abdominal wall is a hexagonal area limited superiorly by the costal margin and the xiphoid process below by the inguinal ligaments and the pelvic bones and on each side the mid axillary lines we can divide the anterior abdominal wall into two regions, median and anterolateral region. The median region contains the rectus abdominis and the pyramidalis muscles. They are enclosed within the rectus sheath. The anterolateral region is formed of three flat muscles arranged in a plywood appearance. They are from outside to inside, the external oblique, the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. These muscles and their aponeuroses contribute to the formation of the rectus sheath. Then their aponeuroses fuse in the midline to form the linea alba. The general functions of the anterior abdominal wall first organ protection since the anterior abdominal wall is lacking the skeletal component so the muscles and the collagen component of the anterior abdominal wall serve in organ protection especially the tonic contraction of the internal oblique muscle they also move the trunk and maintain the body posture they maintain and increase the intra-abdominal pressure which is important in many vital functions within our body as in forced expiration, coughing, sneezing, phonation, micturation, defecation, etc. Beneath the skin of the anterior abdominal wall we can see the superficial fascia which is continuous with the rest of the superficial fascia of the body but below the level of the umbilicus the superficial fascia discriminates into two distinct layers a superficial fatty layer and a deep membranous layer the deep membranous layer extends downwards below the level of the inguinal ligament to be attached to the fascia lata of the thigh it also makes a sheath around the penis and the scrotum attaches on each side to the inferior pubic ramus and backwards into the perineal body Another fascia that is present in the anterior abdominal wall is called the transversalis fascia which lies between the deep surface of the transversus abdominis muscle and the extraperitoneal fat. This fascia is continuous above with the infradiaphragmatic fascia, backwards with the fascia covering the iliacus and the psoas major muscles, below with the pelvic fascia and below the level of the arcuate line which lies midway between the umbilicus and the symphysis pubis. The fascia transversalis is the only support for the posterior surface of the rectus abdominis forming posterior rectus sheath. It also contains the deep inguinal ring and gives the internal spermatic fascia which surrounds the spermatic cord. The rectus abdominis muscle lies in the median region of the anterior abdominal wall within the rectus sheath. It is attached above to the fifth, sixth, and seventh costal cartilages and also to the xiphoid process and below it is attached to the pubic wrist, pubic symphysis and the superior ramus of the pubis. It lies between the linea alba medially and the linea semilunaris laterally. The linea semilunaris is this curved line that extends from the tip of the ninth costal cartilage to the pubic tubercle and denotes the lateral border of the muscle. The rectus abdominis muscle is attached to the anterior rectus sheath by three to four fibrous bands, while there is no attachment between the muscle and the posterior rectus sheath. The significance of the tendinous intersections of the rectus abdominis muscle, besides it demarcates the segmental origin during embryologic development, these tendinous intersections provide pending points or pending locations 
within the muscle allowing it to fold effectively otherwise there will be excessive shortening of the vertical muscle fibers and punching of the fibers they also give transverse strength to the rectus abdominis muscle to withstand the forces applied by the anterolateral muscles thus preventing the two recti being pulled apart another small muscle that is present in the median region of the abdomen it is the pyramidalis muscle so it is a small triangular muscle it is absent in 10 up to 70 percent of the population on average about 20 percent of the population either on one side or on both sides it lies anterior to the inferior part of the rectus abdominis and also lies within the rectus sheath it is attached to the pupus and the pubic symphysis and inserts at the linea alba midway between the umbilicus and the pubis it tenses the linea alba so it acts like a facial tensor together with the pectoralis major muscles which send myofascial extension that is attached to the linea alba from above they also tenses or pulls the linea alba the external oblique is one of the flat muscles that lie on the anterolateral region of the anterior abdominal wall its fibers pass intermedially from the lower eight ribs interdigitating with the serratus anterior muscle to insert at the outer lip of the anterior half of the iliac crest then beyond the line that extends between the tip of the ninth costal cartilage and the anterior superior iliac spine the muscle fiber of the external oblique transform into a aponeurosis this aponeurosis is pi laminar or made of two strata one superficial and one deep it will pass in front of the rectus abdominis to form the anterior wall of the rectus sheath while its lower border folds upon itself and form the inguinal ligament which is stretched between the anterior superior iliac spine laterally and the pubic tubercle medially it has a triangular opening it's called the superficial inguinal ring which transmits the spermatic cord and it is covered by the external oblique fascia which gives the external spermatic fascia around the spermatic cord deep to the external oblique lies the internal oblique muscle its fibers pass anteromedially from the thoracolumbar fascia from the iliac crest its lowermost fibers arise from the iliopubic ligament which is derived from the iliopsoas fascia which lies deep to the inguinal ligament the aponeurosis of the internal oblique splits at the level of the linea semilunaris into two layers to form the anterior and the posterior walls of the rectus sheath deep to the internal oblique lies the transversus abdominis muscle it arises from the inner surface of the lower six costal cartilages interdigitating with the diaphragm also arise from the thoracolumbar and iliopsoas fasci and the iliac crest at the area between the lateral border of the rectus abdominis and the linea semilunaris there is a fascia called spigelian fascia which is a common site of hernia especially below the level of the umbilicus we call it the spigelian hernia the lower border of the transversus abdominis together with the internal oblique muscle arch together and form the conjoined tendon another important landmark in the anterior abdominal wall which lies between the umbilicus and the symphysis pupus and at this level the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis aponeurosis change their direction and pass in front of the rectus abdominis to form the anterior wall of the rectus sheath below the level of the arcuate line when the two muscles change their direction at the same level they make a single arcade while if they pass one below the other they form a double arcade Regarding the physiology or the biomechanics of the anterior abdominal wall muscles, the rectus abdominis and the external oblique undergo greater length changes compared with the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. And this could be explained by 
the length of their muscle fiber. The internal oblique muscles on each side serve as an anchor points on iliac bones to opposite external oblique and transverse abdominis to ensure stability of the trunk and the upright posture. So if we look at this diagram, we can see that the internal oblique, for example, on the right side of the body splits into two layers and they communicate with the external oblique and the transverse abdominis of the opposite sides in the form of a seat belt appearance. So this kind of attachment approximates the pelvic bones to the chest cavity or to the trunk and this will give stability of the trunk in the upright posture. Also, the attachment of the internal oblique to the transverse abdominis of the opposite side ensures the approximation of the two iliac bones together, thus stabilizing the sacroiliac joint. Above the level of the umbilicus, the crisscross plywood arrangement of the muscle fibers and the aponeurosis allows distensibility needed for respiration, while below the level of the umbilicus, the fibers are directed downwards and medially and even overlap as in the lower ends of the rectus abdominis muscle for elastic belly support. Regarding the collagenous component of the anterior abdominal wall, I will start first with the rectus sheath. We will divide the anterior abdominal wall into three regions superior to the costal margin. At this level, the anterior wall of rectus sheath is made by the aponeurosis of the external oblique, while the posterior wall of rectus sheath is absent and the muscle rests on the 5th, 6th and 7th costal cartilages. The second level lies between the costal margin and the arcuate line. At this level, there is an anterior wall and posterior wall of rectus sheath. In this transverse section of the anterior abdominal wall muscles, we will notice that the three flat muscles on the lateral side each has a bilaminar aponeurosis. So the anterior wall of rectus sheath is formed of the two lamina of the external oblique and the anterior lamina of the internal oblique while behind the rectus sheath, the posterior wall is formed of the posterior lamina of the internal oblique and the two lamina of the transverse abdominis muscle. Inferior to the level of the arcuate line, all the three aponeuroses of the external oblique, internal oblique and transverse abdominis pass in front of the rectus abdominis and form its anterior wall. While the posterior wall of rectus sheath is deficient and the rectus abdominis is only covered by the fascia transversalis. So in this cross section, we can notice that the bilaminar aponeurosis of the external oblique, internal oblique and the transverse abdominis pass in front of the rectus abdominis to form its anterior wall. While the posterior wall is made only of fascia transversalis below the level of the arcuate line. In this picture, we can notice the difference in the arrangement of the aponeurotic fibers above the level of the umbilicus and below the level of the umbilicus. So above the level of the umbilicus, it is described to be in a triple crisscross plywood appearance, while below the level of the umbilicus, the fibers just approximate uh, towards each other. The linea alpha is a fiber tendinous reef wider above than below. It extends from the xiphoid process to the pubic symphysis. It's formed by the decussating aponeurotic fibers of the three anterolateral muscles on each side in either single or triple decussation. There is also different orientation of the fibers that is present in the linea alpha at both craniocaudal direction and also at ventrodorsal direction. In this diagram, we can notice that there is a single decussation at both the anterior and posterior walls of the rectus sheath, while here there is a single decussation in the anterior wall while triple decussation in the posterior wall of rectus sheath, and here we can notice triple decussation at both the anterior and posterior walls of rectus sheath. So the triple crisscross 
pattern of decussation is seen in both the anterior and posterior rectus sheath, but more in the posterior. The anterior sheath is more resistant to traction below the arcuate line, but less resistant to pressure above it, while the posterior rectus sheath shows similar resistance to traction above and below the umbilicus, and also slightly less resistant to pressure in the region of the arcuate line. In this diagram, we can see the arrangement of the aponeurotic fibers in the linea alba. So in the ventral layer of linea alba, there is oblique arrangement of the collagen fibers, while in the dorsal layer, there is a transverse arrangement of the collagen fibers, and then it is covered by an irregular layer of collagen fibers. Also, the elastine fiber layer that is present in the linea alba intermingle with the collagen fibers and ensure their elastic recoil. This architecture or arrangement of the collagen and the elastic fibers in the linea alba led to an anisotropic mechanical behavior with more compliance in the vertical direction and higher stress in the transverse direction. If we compare the supra and the infra umbilical parts of the anterior abdominal wall with each other, so at the supra umbilical part we have a tight skin, while a lax skin at the infra umbilical part. Less subcutaneous fat in the supra umbilical region, while the subcutaneous fat in the infra umbilical part is more abundant. The linea alba is well developed at the supra umbilical part of the anterior abdominal wall while it is weakly developed below the level of the umbilicus, The external oblique aponeurosis is weak at the supra-umbilical part of the anterior abdominal wall, while it is strong and well-developed at the infra-umbilical part. Above the level of the umbilicus, the anterior and posterior rectus sheath are present, while below the level of the umbilicus, the anterior rectus sheath is only present, while the posterior rectus sheath is the fashion. Above the level of the umbilicus, the two rectus abdominis muscles are separated, while below the level of the umbilicus, the two rectus abdominis muscles are close to each other and even overlap. So these structural changes are reflected on the function of the anterior abdominal wall above and below the level of the umbilicus. Above the level of the umbilicus, it is called the parachute area because of the triple crisscross arrangement of the muscle fibers and aponeurosis, this allows distension of the upper part of the abdomen, thus supports the respiratory movement. If there is failure of support of the upper abdomen in this region, we will end up with hernias like the epigastric hernia, the umbilical, and the paraumbilical hernias. While below the level of the umbilicus, it is called the pili support area, and the main function of the muscles and fibers there is to support the lower part of the abdomen. If there is failure in this region, we will end up with direct or indirect inguinal hernias and also femoral hernia and spigillian hernia as well. For the umbilical region, let's see first this diagram which indicates the umbilical region at the fetus. This is the anterior abdominal wall and this is the attached umbilical cord. What concerns us uh, here is that we have two umbilical arches. They lie on each side of the urinary bladder. Its apex is attached to the urecus which passes uh, inside the umbilical cord. We also have the umbilical vein, which will pass at the free uh, lower border of the falciform ligament in its way to the liver. After birth and falling of the umbilical cord, the umbilical ring is formed. It is a fibrous cicatrix that represents the area of fusion between the median umbilical ligament, or the obliterated urecus, and the two medial umbilical ligaments or the obliterated umbilical arteries. The round ligament of the liver, which is the obliterated umbilical vein, traverses the umbilical ring and passes superiorly within the falciform ligament on its way to the liver. For the anatomical variations, which is present in the umbilical ring region, 
In about 74% of the population, we can notice that the round ligament of the liver is continuous with the uricus and is attached to the lower border of the umbilical ring. In about 24% of the population, both the round ligament of the liver and the uricus splits into two branches to be attached to the upper border of the umbilical ring and the lower border of the umbilical ring making two triangles and this arrangement could be linked to the supra and infra umbilical hernias. In less than 1% of the population, the round ligament of the liver splits into two branches. Each is continuous with the medial umbilical ligament and has no attachment to the umbilical ring. For the umbilical fascia, if we look at this diagram, this is a longitudinal section of the anterior abdominal wall showing the umbilical ring region. And we can see the layers forming the anterior abdominal wall at this region. So we have here the skin the subcutaneous fat, the linea alba, the median umbilical ligament and the round ligament of the liver, the fascia transversalis, which thickens behind the umbilical ring to form the umbilical fascia, and behind it lies the peritoneum. So the umbilical fascia is a thin fascia layer that extends between the medial umbilical ligaments it extends inferiorly to become continuous with the visceral fascia enclosing the urinary bladder. It has many anatomical variations, so it either completely covers and supports the umbilical ring from behind, or only covers its upper part, or its lower part, or in some cases it lies away from the umbilical ring, and this is probably associated with umbilical hernia. This would be the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. If you liked it, please do not forget to subscribe, like, and share. And do not forget to hit the notification bell so you can know if I upload another video. Please feel free to leave a comment below. See you in the next video. Thank you.